Welcome everyone to this uh, second session of family business training, um, the second in a series of seven. And today uh, we will be discussing the subject of designing family business ownership. Um, uh, we are obviously um, dealing with a number of subjects and today we, were, we are starting with a foundational subject, a fundamental subject, which is how um, family business can go about uh, designing their family business ownership. This is a fundamental subject because um, the way family business is um, set up uh, will many a times, and the way they set up ownership will many times determine how family businesses will operate in the future and have very long lasting implications. Now, obviously, it is very difficult to bring every uh, family business with their different complexities and the range of family businesses from small to medium. Sometimes even we have very large family businesses uh, in the world. Um, you know, bring them, bring them all into a, a number of models that can fit in within a presentation. However, if we take a generic perspective and we look at ownership models, we today have four different ownership models, um, which by and large encapsulate um, all, or at least the most popular ownership models we normally find in family businesses. The first ownership model is the sole owner. That is not just when I mean sole owner ownership model, I do not just mean someone who is a sole trader, but even those family businesses that operate um, in an ownership structure where they have a single owner and family business that move from one generation to the next by identifying a single owner for each generation. Then we have the partnership model whereby the people involved as being family business owners are only those that actually decide to become actively involved in the managing of the business. The third model is the distributed model, is the inclusive model to the ultimate extent, if you want to call it that way. It is where any business, uh, any family business own uh, member, so anyone who is a member of the family, is actually by right given the ownership status. And so uh, there is no distinction between who is involved, who is not involved, who is firstborn, who is not firstborn, or whatever type, other type of distinction. Basically, everyone is given the same status, the same ownership, and the same voting rights. And finally, there is the concentrated model, whereby we still many a times find that every family member and every descendant is given some form of ownership, but then you have a smaller subset of people, a smaller group, sometimes it could be even one person, whereby these persons, besides ownership, have better, higher control, normally through voting, voting rights. And so, Although everyone under the concentrated model or all family members are shareholders, not all shareholders and family members have the same voting rights. Now, here I explained ownership models. However, I'm pleased to say that today with us, we also have the family business office regulator, Dr. Joe Gerardo, and I thank him for finding time to be with us today. And we will use a bit of his time so that he can explain to us the legal this time, not ownership model, so the legal corporate structures that um, family businesses uh, can have. And most importantly, since he has the family business office, what are the legal corporate structures that the Family Business Act contemplates um, as being family business, as being actual family business and defined as family businesses under the Family Business Act. Joe, thanks for joining us and for your thanks. time. And I leave it up to you to explain explain this legal part. Hi, Silva. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity and giving the Family Business Office this opportunity 
to explain further some aspects of the Family Business Act, which, as you correctly stated, falls under the remit of this of this office. As you also correctly stated, um, uh, we have to distinguish between different models, which you have been explaining very well, and which I'm sure will, you will go into further detail um, during today's session and perhaps even during future sessions. But there's also the legal aspect falling um, under the Family Business Act. And what I will be talking about are the different models or different structures of um, legal structures, mainly of businesses that the Family Business Act accepts for registration under the Act. Obviously, not every family business is required to register under the Act. It's actually voluntary to register under the Act. The benefits, I will not go into them today, but perhaps in the future we'll have some, some opportunity to go into that as well. Um, but those family businesses which register on the act, under the Act would perhaps have certain benefits that other businesses which are not registered would not have. The Act itself um, starts with a very basic principle. The basic principle is that you need to have at least two family members, two related family members. It could be two spouses, okay, which are still considered to be family members. It could be two brothers, a brother and a sister, etc., who are involved directly in the family business. Now, when we say directly, it means having, if you're operating under a partnership, they would be partners. If you're operating under a limited liability company, they would be both shareholders. And at least one of them would have the management, the day-to-day -day management um, uh, in his hands. So he would be directly involved in the day-to-day -to -day management of that business. None of these two family members can have more than 80% ownership in the business, okay? And I think here it's important to delve a bit into why. Why does the Act um, distinguish between um, who has more than 80% shareholding and why does it require not having more than 80% shareholding? The reason being is that the Act or the legislator believes that for family businesses, to have a better chance of success when it when the business is being passed to future generations. So when it comes to succession, mainly there's a better chance if the ownership and control is distributed for that uh, the succession in that business to take place than if ownership is concentrated under, for example, as you have mentioned, the sole, sole ownership or sole trader structure where you have one person who is basically who has the, the main control of the business the in his hands. Exactly, exactly. So that is the idea. And here I wanted to, to make it very clear, as people, as the audience will understand, and as you will be explaining, it doesn't mean that what the Family Business Act defines as a family business. It's the only definition that exists in the world, far from it, until. Um, as we know, there are various definitions. In fact, when the Act was being drafted, one of the issues was to come up with a definition because there were so many different definitions of what a family business is that we had to see what the legislator wants, what are the objectives in Malta, what do we want to achieve, and based on those objectives, a decision in consultation with a number of stakeholders was taken to, uh, to um, uh, establish this particular definition of a family business. The Family Business Act itself, under Article 3, when we speak about the family business, we're talking about Chapter 565 of the Laws of Malta. It gives very structures, legal structures, which um, a family business can operate under so that it can then register under the Act. It tells us that any family business needs to be trading at least for, for three years before it can register under the Act. Reason behind that is that obviously it has to be a going concern and it would be to a certain extent futile to register a family business under the Act upon its inception when, as we know, some businesses will succeed and others will fail. And we know that in the first three years of a business, um, uh, those three years are very crucial. So in those three years, very often a business will either fail or succeed. So any business which has been trading for at least three years 
under one of these structures I'm going to mention now, where you have at least two family members who are shareholders or partners and have direct involvement, would be eligible to register under the Act. And here we are talking about partnerships, whether registered or unregistered. This means that a partnership can have the form of an agreement between two family members who say, listen, we have a business together, we're running the business together. The partnership agreement would also state um, what involvement there is by each member, so the percentage of ownership, where the control lies, so who's going to be managing the day-to-day -day business, etc., etc., or it can be even registered. So obviously it would be registered with the, with the Malta Business Registry. Then you have the limited liability companies, public companies, you have foundations and also trusts. So what we're saying here is that basically any legal structure which comes in the form of a, of a partnership um, or where you have ultimate beneficial owners or at least two members of the family would practically, practically be eligible to, to register under the Act. At the moment, as things stand, sole traders, so those who are self-employed with a V8 number, even if, because we have this question very often, even if they employ another family member, but there is no control and ownership by that family member in at least 20% of the ownership, then that business would not would not um, qualify oh, as a family business under the Act. It might qualify as a family business in itself under a different definition, but not under the Act. So even if it is a family business and this, it's not a sole trader because they have a limited liability company, but the shareholding is 100% owned by one family member, then it is not eligible to be defined as a family business under the Family Business Act. Correct. And that kind of company we would refer to it as a single member company in this exactly. case, but totally correct. A single member company where you have ownership by one by one family member would not qualify. One thing I wanted to add as well is that the Act also envisages participation by third parties who are not family members and also by employees of the company. Okay. And in its totality, it envisages up to 15% ownership approximately, okay, between employees and third parties who are not family members, ownership in that company, and that would still qualify as a as, family business. As a family family business under the Act. Okay. Obviously, Silvan, from here, I want to thank the audience um, uh, that is following us. I'm sure there will be questions, and that is why we are we have these sessions. Any questions that they may have, um, they can contact our office, they can contact the chamber, and we will direct their queries accordingly, according to their needs. And obviously, we can even meet them and explain further to them to see whether such business would qualify under the Act or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerada. Thanks for your time. Thanks for Thank you, your sir. very informative and insightful information. Obviously, I know you have a very busy schedule, but I still thank you for finding the time to give this very valuable input to family businesses. Thank Thanks you. Looking forward to the next session, Silvan. Uh, well, even I, obviously, a lot of work and preparation has been done in order to try to present the best possible sessions for our family businesses. Thank you. Thanks Perfect. a lot, Dr. Thank Gerard. You. Bye. Bye. We will uh, obviously continue in our session. So I explained um, the format that our uh, that ownership formats that family businesses can can take. I will now move on in un, in explaining why choosing the right format ownership format is is important because it is not merely a formality or it is not something that you said I don't know ages ago ownership and ownership structures are very dynamic especially as businesses grow and have different needs um, they have a lot of implications on the business on the family and so um, it is extremely important that when setting the ownership rights structure we um, we not only keep an open mind but we try to have a future a forward-looking vision um, we understand what are the implications of the type of ownership choices we have to make, implication on the business and on the family. 
we understand the implications, not in the, just in the short term, but also on the long term. And we have to see over time if the ownership structure we have been operating with for a number of years, if it is still relevant, if it is still serving us well, if it is going to take us into the future in a strong way, or if it needs to be changed. And please, if it needs to be changed, let's start working as soon as possible to have it change because it is one hell of a process. When trying to choose what type of ownership model you want to operate with, you want to use, you need to give yourself answers to three important questions. And I call these the three core questions for you to choose the ownership model. Do you want your business value, all the past earnings, the reserved earnings you have accumulated and assets you have, you have uh, acquired through your hard work over the years and decades that you have been managing and working in your family business to remain integrated together in one structure? Or do you want to separate them in different structures? That is a very important and very strategic, I would say, decision. And so it is an important consideration any family business needs to take, especially in particular junctures, which will impinge on the ownership model for family businesses. Do the second question is answering who can and will be an owner. Do you envisage that any family member can be an owner or will only the family members who work and operate in the business be owners? Uh, because obviously this yet again will impinge on the, on the ownership structure you will want to, to, to set up. And finally, who from all the owners will have control? Will we go for an inclusive, a shared ownership control model, whereby basically anyone who is a shareholder can have a level of control, pari passu with the level of shareholder, or will the actual control and decision, ultimate decision, be consolidated in a few hands or a single person, it could be, by having different type of shares and different voting rights assigned to them, okay? Obviously, there are pluses and minuses on each type of method, uh, but these are considerations that I'm putting them at the front at the beginning on purpose because these are considerations that need to be taken when, um, uh, when deciding which ownership model the family business needs to go for. And so, as principle, you need to be very clear whether you believe that the way forward for your business is whether you want to integrate and so you use an ownership model, an inclusive ownership model, which integrates things together, or whether it is better if you separate. And here I normally start getting, when I deal with clients, the $100 million question, what is best for me? Well, it's obviously you would need to make that decision depending on your situation. What I can tell you is the rationale as to why sometimes people decide to integrate and they have an inclusive model whereby they include everyone and so they they do not separate and those um, the rationale for those family business that do the opposite and decide to separate okay normally those that integrate and use an inclusive model they give a lot of strength and importance in trying to keep the family united and they try to as much as possible to increase the strength and the volume of the business um, by keeping it under one cap if you want to call it or one grouping um, they try as much as possible to have a very homogeneous look as to how wealth is distributed among members of the family um, and they try, they give a lot of importance in uh, keeping the family wealth 
together um, by keeping their assets, their assets together. On the other hand, those that uh, decide to implement a separate and, uh, and exclusive model um, uh, are afraid that they, with the inclusive model, you increase the risk of family conflict. Why? Because obviously under the inclusive model, you are uh, putting, you have more people that need to be involved in any decision, which means that there is more chance, more room for conflict to arise because you have to convince more people, you have to persuade more people, people have different family members, have different priorities, different ideas, different agendas. And so the possibility of conflict um, and obviously the, 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 the need to have a lot of decisions, difficult decisions taken by a larger group of people uh, gives the chance there is a probability that conflict arise, arise uh, even more. And so having a separate and exclusive model whereby business is separate assets or where you have um, uh, and ownership with different voting rights. And so you have a separate system there as well. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, TA is in this instance the preferred, the preferred model in order to reduce the possibility for conflict. Um, uh, you also create um, the notion that whoever creates, you know, whoever goes for the separate model, that uh, family members should not expect them to be dependent on the business, um, that you can only be dependent on the business and you can only expect an income which you can make a real living out of the business if you really give value, if you really work, if you really contribute towards the business. And it reduces the separate model also reduces a level of complexity to run and manage the business because decision can, decisions can be taken fairly easier rather than convincing and uh, reaching a consensus with all family members who would be shareholders under the inclusive and integrated, integrated model. Here, <coughs> It is basically, I am presenting similar concepts using different wording, basically. Um, inclusive and exclusive. I'm using different wording because many a times um, you find that different people use different wording. And so obviously I want to show you that basically they mean the same thing. Um, but when we say, as I said before, um, integrated and separate, I mean also inclusive and exclusive. Um, and obviously every model comes with its own pluses and minuses as I've been explaining. I mean the inclusive model besides what I've just mentioned also um, avoids has the plus that it avoids um, creating any incentive to try to push yourself into becoming an owner because basically everyone is going to be an owner just the same under that model. It also means that capital is meant is kept in the business rather than under the divisive model where people try to have under the separate model they try to buy out someone else and so use the capital of the business to buy out some brother, some sister, some cousin, so that they reduce the number of people they need to convince. Um, they can have access to, under the inclusive model, the talent pool across generations because everyone is going to be involved. Um, uh, and it avoids conflict over the definition of who is an ownership and who can be an ownership because under the inclusive model, basically, everyone who is a family member can be an owner. However, the exclusive model, uh, since uh, it, it is exclusive as the name implies, so you have a, um, a smaller subset of people who are actually owners, has the advantage 
that is is much easier to align the interest among the owners rather aligning the interest among an enormous amount of owners. It reduces conflicts and the possibility of conflicts, as we already saw, allows obviously the business to focus more on what the business needs and less on dealing with conflicts, with questions, with people who are not understanding, especially from those people who are owners but not, are not actually involved in the business. Um, and it, it, since we're dealing with a smaller group and normally the group involved are those who are really interested in the business, they, uh, it ensures that you know all the family shareholders are actually those who know exactly what is happening in the business and what the business really, really needs. So one of the uh, decisions to be taken when speaking about family business ownership is do we want shared control? Do we want um, you know balance of power in order to prevent any one person or a subset of persons to take all the decisions himself or herself, which is <coughs> sorry, very much in line with uh, what the Family Business Act wants to prevent, as Dr. Joe Gerada has just said. Do you want to avoid a situation where owners, um, you know, where may decide to sell um, uh, and and uh, may decide that since they want to sell, they better take capital from the business through dividend distribution rather than reinvest it for it to grow, and so they may be threatening its future viability. Or do you want? Um, and so you want a shared control to avoid these circumstances. Are these your major worries? Or you prefer having a single and restricted control because your worries are of a different nature. Okay? Your worries are that if you do not have a single or restricted control, so a, a separate and exclusive model, decision making in the business is going to be close to impossible. And therefore, you need to have this type of model to ensure that decisions are taken quickly in business. OK, and you are more worried that if more people are involved in the business, there are going to be a lot of conflicts in the business. And so by having a, a limited or a single authority that actually designs in the business, that is a sure way of resolving or avoiding having conflicts. It depends, obviously, your circumstance of your family business and where you believe the greatest needs or the greatest risk lies. If in creating balance of power, in creating uh, a situation of checks and balances, and so if that is you want a shared control, or if it is in decision making and in avoiding conflicts, and in that way you most probably would prefer having a restricted and exclusive ownership control model. And so we put things together and when we put things together, we normally uh, come up with this matrix where we are putting together the on one hand, on one axis, we're putting together the uh, whether your ownership criteria is going to be inclusive or exclusive. And we're putting together whether the decision making control you know, you're going to be using is unified and shared. And as one can see, um, if you want a unified decision making control <coughs> with uh, sole owner, with, with uh, exclusive ownership criteria, you are obviously starting from the sole owner, whether it's a sole trader or whether it is a company, as we explained before, with one single owner. Normally, businesses are likely to transition over time as they grow, because normally family businesses start out in the lower left hand, you know, they are a startup, they have just the first generation, uh, the inventor, the, the person that started with the business, and the ownership is normally exclusive to that founder. Normally, they start even from a legal perspective as a sole trader, and then they set up a company whereby they himself or just himself and his wife are shareholders. Um, and normally, they remain that way 
um, uh, until the business grows and we start to move into second generation. Having said that, as I explained in the very beginning, there are family business models, ownership models that remain that way even when passing from one generation to the next, whereby they decide they want to remain with a unified and exclusive um, ownership criteria. And so they always uh, choose, identify a, no, a single person who will be leading and taking decision of the family business from one generation to the next. And basically, uh, he would be the person taking the business or she who would be the person taking the business forward. However, what normally when businesses grow and they come to make the first generation move to the children or whatever, they move and they normally move to a partnership model, um, which basically means that there is a connection between the ownership and active participation, but the amount of owners that are now involved in the business obviously grows. Okay, And so we have, although we still have an exclusive ownership criteria, we um, uh, we have a shared decision making, obviously shared now by the second generation. And normally, as businesses grow, okay, they would need to grow to adapt their family business ownership even even further. Some decide to go down the route, um, which is the full open route, whereby uh, they decide that they want to be completely inclusive and so go down what is called the distributed model, whereby the ownership criteria uh, is inclusive and all the decision making control is shared. That means both ownership and control is widely shared by all shareholders. And so that is why we call it the distributed um, ownership. And basically no one is required to be actively involved and participate and the shares are just passed down to you through normal family, family lines. However, some go down the route from sole ownership partnership and then decide to go down the concentrated level whereby they uh, in, do an inclusive model of ownership, so they give ownership to all family members, but then when it comes to control, to voting rights, to decision making, they, you, they prefer a unified, whereby they have a smaller subset, normally people who are very much involved in the business or one person, uh, who actually then has the voting rights and the, is the person who ultimately can call can call the shots. There are particular circumstances whereby I strongly, I strongly advise family members to really, to really revisit their ownership structure and see if it is forward looking, if it is uh, set up in a way which will uh, make, uh, allow the business to grow on strong foundations and to have a future also future transition. In fact, the first junction is when preparations are ongoing for the next generation uh, that is coming into the business. We'll speak about succession planning in session six, but obviously when it comes to ownership structures, uh, a good point where you, 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 it is time to revisit whereby your ownership structure is the one you need is when the next generation is coming into the business. When obviously the business has grown and is growing and the number of people involved in the business, the complexity of the business, if, especially if you're diversifying into other business areas. And so the complexity of the business changes significantly. That is obviously a good juncture where you need to consider your ownership structure. Um, when you have capital constraints because you need to move forward, you need to buy out owners of the business and unless you do that, the business, business cannot grow any further. It is obviously a very important juncture at which you need to, um, um, to check and uh, see whether you have the right ownership model. Obviously, when you're stuck in conflict um, and when 
your uh, uh, when you decide that you the time has come because of circumstances that the family business needs to be there's a transition from family the ownership remains within the family but the leadership the management uh, is now being uh, is going to be handed to non family members and so the ownership uh, structure can change so that there is a even a bigger distinction between the family level and the family ownership and where it can uh, what it needs and expects from the business and the management side which will not be family members here i have in order to try to explain what uh, you know what are the implications of each ownership time i have gone through each uh, ownership model and try to come up with you know the benefits and challenges why because many times i as a family business advisor i get asked but you know which is the best model for me and whatever and really and truly there isn't a best model this is not a one size fits all it depends on your circumstances so a sole owner when you have a single family whether it's a sole trader or whether it's a company with a single uh, shareholder um you know this works best um, when the business needs you know, have a person that takes uh, you know control um and when the business uh, has not grown enough that it can you know distribute profits to other owners even if they do are not actively participating in the business okay it's, this is this type of ownership model is when especially uh, family business are still in its infancy and they have not grown grown a lot uh, however if the business grows and this is creating uh, profits and it can create liquidity for owners and it wants to start thinking about its future beyond its present owner obviously if we remain with this model then that can create challenges because if we remain with this model how the successor, the, the, the person who's going to be the anointed one, the chosen one, becomes central. Because, you know, you're not managing a monarchy here. At the end of the day, you're managing a business. And so, um, the sole owner um, will still need, uh, you know, that, that was given the, the baton and the chosen one, the anointed one, will still need to most probably have in an informal way some benefits given to the rest of the family um, in the case of parents some parents for example pass on assets to children who are not the chosen one assets that are outside of the business some property for example um, others decide that they still want to keep the between one generation and, and the next the sole ownership model but they and they also the assets within the business but expect the sole owner to still take care of everyone else in some way or form and normally this expectation is not documented but it's sort of written <coughs> i'm sorry it is sort of included in in the family culture then we have the um, the partnership model, which is, was the model where we are only the those family members who are actively participating in the business can be owners. And here the benefits are almost obvious in the sense that uh, only those who participate um, can become owners of the business, um, and so. Th Basically, you're making sure that those who get the greatest benefits of uh, the business are those that are really, you know, sweating uh, and, 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 and putting their energy into this business. Um, and, you know, we can think about um, distributing profits to non-owners when the business grows and can handle also people who are not participating. The challenge here is that obviously there needs to be clarity um, as to how people make it to the ownership groups um, and so how we define active participation and non-active participation. 
Um, and obviously, one of the key difficulties here is that obviously, as the business grows, those who are not involved today will have a higher sort of price that they need to pay if they want to become owners into the future, because they would then need to become owners of a business that has grown and has more value. Um, so that is obviously one of the downsides of this, of this, of this model. Then we have the distributed model, which is basically an all-inclusive model, basically that all anyone that is part of the family can be a shareholder, um, and that everyone is kept within one, all assets are kept within one structure of the family business, um, and that all family descendants are owners and have the same decision rights, the same voting rights. Here, obviously, the challenge is quite obvious. It is difficult to align the interests of different owners, especially if the numbers are large, who have different interests, different engagement levels, uh, with no one having a majority shareholding. Um, and so the key word here is working to build consensus, which is obviously very difficult, which requires skills in communication and persuasion. Um, and if there are a huge numbers, one of the biggest problems is that the ownership group can risk becoming distant from the business and from the management of the business and can also lose lose control over what is happening in, in the business. And finally, we have the concentrated model, um, which has the same advantages similar to the sole trader. The, you know, decisions can be taken quickly by one person on a very concentrated number of people. Obviously, um, here you solve a lot of problems that you we are just discussed on the distributed type, you know, with uh, possible conflicts, difficult to find consensus and whatever. But obviously you create others because there is the big question of how do we decide who is to exercise the control and so who has more um, voting rights and this deciding who gets this over from one generation to the next get, many a times gets even uh, more more complicated and so having family constitutions for example who uh, are uh, adopted to create criteria as to uh, who gets these uh, control uh, voting rights is, is very important. Who is most qualified? Who, you know, gives more contribution to the business? You know, how is this defined? Um, and also there is the challenge of um, not having those owners who do not have the voting rights of the subset of the or the concentrated amount of people not to feel disengaged okay and so the importance of having the family room as we will discuss when we discuss about about uh, about uh, corporate governance in in the in in the next session um this brings us to an end on the second session um at least to the end of my input on the second session because this after my input, I will we will have um, uh, um, um, two interviews with uh, family business owners on their experience of uh, the ownership structures and how the ownership structures have transitioned across generations. And uh, we will be meeting with Isabel the Battista from Miribel Holdings, and we will meeting also Natalie Borsbriffa from the Vassallo, Vassallo Group, who I both kindly thank for their time to answer my questions on the subject. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our family business model in, in this perspective. As you rightly said, it is very important for family businesses to have the right structures in place for the business to operate. 
um, our business model probably has a unique characteristic because the, the way it has been shaped, um, it was a, a, a very inclusive model and each and every one of the family members became a shareholder when we were 18 years of age. So basically the, the business initially uh, belonged to the parents, to our parents, and each and every one of our siblings became an owner um, on the, as soon as we, we reached the age of 18. The inclusive, obviously both the inclusive and the exclusive models have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the, obviously, our history shows us, our history tells, us, tells a very nice story because in our case, although it was an inclusive model, each and every one of the shareholders are very actively involved. And we are all very much participative in the processes, in the structures, and in the full functioning of the business. I would say that apart from obviously having a very good vision and a plan way ahead of time, uh, the other great component which has successfully led us to where we are today was the fact that the business was always run on very good governance. Um, as of early days, the business was never made up of just family members. We always had the inclusion of non-family members in the decision-making processes as executive directors and non-executive directors and the business was throughout run on very rigid good government, good governance principles. So I think that was a very good successful tool that was inbuilt in the structure of the company as of very early days. It was very well a uh, very well oiled and structured platform as of early days and I think that that was the key to to facilitate uh, the progress and the developments of the companies as it continues to grow and as it is continually growing even in, in the present scenarios.